what are some of the positive experiences you've had um uh, and are there some best practices that you've seen at a club i will start with bilal here um bilal obviously you um have led a team of uh, international players to a tournament so if you can share your experiences please what the positive some of the positive things you've seen and um best practices at any clubs uh kira goes salam everyone um yeah, for me, um, like I was talking to you guys the other day, from a from a young age, sort of growing up in New Zealand, it was very easy for us to sort of um, get along with everyone, especially in sporting, um, like team events. So we, our our family and our boys were involved in a lot of um, sort of rugby from a young age, and also cricket, um, also athletics. Uh, we were very like a sporting sort of all around family. And um, sort of yeah, growing up, watching the All Blacks play and, you know, sort of like, you know, enjoying the, enjoying all the games and sort of, you know, especially the winning moments. That really got us, you know, like to achieve our goals from a young age. Um, from, a, from a club level, we, we didn't play much club level, especially all our brothers and stuff. So our, our parents were also sort of on the strict, strict side and, you know, they had us sort of um, us to like leading towards more of like, you know, coming from a Afghan war and torn country. I think, you know, um, study and, you know, was more more first priority than sport. But as the years gone on and then the high school and stuff and then my little brother, he played for the Warriors. So that that was a big achievement for the family. Um, then then the rugby team actually came in very late, actually, the Afghanistan rugby team. Um, which there's about five of the Slamanko family members, uh, or six, sorry, six of them are involved in the team. So it's a sevens rugby team. So it's pretty much like a, a family sort of um, a family uh, team. Uh, we also have a few other players from around the world um, that are getting involved with rugby. Also, uh, a lot of players are getting involved in Afghanistan at the moment um, through the th- through rugby and. Um, also training and that's that's been happening for the last few years. Um, see, seeing the positives out of that is that we a lot of our the boys that, that are in the team at the moment um, are also like you know they've they've been in in the in uh, like in New Zealand or in Australia or England UK we've got a few players from. Um, the, the thing is that the environment is very good. They know how to like communicate with each other. You know they're really happy with you. Like you know when the team comes together, um, a lot of the boys are are, are are the same age, so which makes it very easy for everyone to get along with. So those are the positive things. So if 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 the if the team and the players are getting along very well with one another, it makes it, it makes it easier for everyone. You know, and that's when the team starts to perform well. Okay. Uh, you're starting to break up, Bila, but what I heard from you is uh, having people of similar kinds together might just help. Uh, on that subject, if I can ask a non-panel member, I know Shona McCarthy from Marist Eastern Rugby, their club has done some great work in um, in engaging um, the Asian community. Shona, are you able to switch on your camera and your microphone and uh, speak to your work a little bit? Because that I find has been a particularly good example. Um. So... The, the Asian Initiative pilot is probably a little bit before my time. Um, that was run in 2019 with the support of New Zealand Rugby and I'm pretty sure Sport Auckland as well. Um, off the back of that program, we now run the Marist Eastern Diversity and Inclusion Strategy, um, which is run in our schools as part of our school, one of our school programs. Um, so since 2019, we've had 20% growth approximately in our Asian registration uh, participants. It's still something that I really want to work on. So those workshops excited me when I saw all the light up of people. I'm like, hey, I'm going to contact you, 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 you and you after this. So <laughs> be ready. Um, but just listening to the the panel members, you know, one of the biggest barriers for us as a club has been language. Um, last year, for example, I had a Chinese lady register um, her son. She actually registered him to the wrong club, but she didn't speak English. I didn't speak Chinese. So 
luckily, um, but Google Translator, although not 100% perfect, um, I managed to get the message through to her and she was able to, you know, come back and confirm. So, you know, having people like yourselves out in the community um, who we could potentially tap into um, to get the message out to our communities and stuff like that as well, that, you know, there are these opportunities available, um, it might help a bit more. I do know around 2019 we did have um, an Asian representative within the club who did do that over on, I think it was We Sport, um, and that really helped with those participation numbers. Um, but I can talk to that a little bit, Shona. Um, so I was involved in that project. Um, so did we had a, uh, yeah, well, we had uh, so your club. Um, I can speak on your behalf. Had a welcoming officer, uh, who was from the community, and so it just uh, added that little bit of a layer of comfort for the community that there was somebody who looked like them, spoke like them, and understood them. Um, so they were uh, they felt uh, um, more confidence to go up to the club and actually ask about rugby, if not actually play it. So that was like a starting point. So yeah, you, it ties in very nicely with what you're saying. I think it's really important. I mean, the other day I was in a, a local bakery grabbing some lunch before heading into one of the schools and the lady that was serving me asked me, oh, do you coach rugby? And I said, well, yeah, I'm just heading down to one of the schools. And she said, I want my son to play, but he's really scared of playing tackle. So I run back out to the canal, <laughs> grab a flyer and say, we've got the ripper teams, you know, and speaking about one of the other barriers like we've introduced the no fees so you know taking that fee component out for our players and families as well because we know it's tough out there you know and we've got to do something about it so these kids can be included in any sport not just not just rugby not just our club so yeah that's some of the stuff we're doing around around that sort of thing so again thank you to everyone that's out there promoting stuff like this because it's absolutely amazing um thank you shona for for sharing and some of the questions and barriers that have been addressed like fi finances and lack of knowledge etc um so my colleague sherry does great work and Sherry, if you can just switch on your camera and talk about talk a little bit about some of the great work that some clubs have been doing that you've seen and you might you've managed to support. Um, yeah, over to you, Sherry. Uh, Sherry, you are on mute. Um, just unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Sun. Um, Kira, everyone. Um. This is a quite good question. Um, so in our work, we see some clubs are really made an efforts to engage our Asian communities. So they organize something like a have a go day to introduce the local sports to the new migrants and former refugees. And um, some of them recruited a bilingual volunteers to make communities at, feel at home. And um, even had the posters and then information and registration form all translated in the languages that the community speak. So all these actions work really well and encourage participation. Um, cool. And if anybody wanted to uh, sort of get in touch um, and wanted to engage the communities, uh, just get in touch with myself or Sherry, and we can get in touch with the appropriate um, community champions, we like to call them, because we can't in invite all of them to uh, a webinar workshop like this. But there's plenty out there that both Sherry, uh, Sherry, Selena, who's also a colleague of mine, who's on the um, on the workshop right now. Um, so we are in touch with them, but um, they will be able to connect you and perhaps even provide some financial support or at least connect you to a potential funder. Um, all right. So going back uh, to one other panel member, Mark, as a as a player, um, what would you say has been a has been a good um, good something good that you've seen a club do and you would encourage others to do as well? So how so how has and what club does well? <laughs> Um, from well, working for the Y, I think success a lot often comes from partnership, collaboration, and being community led. Um, so those three are quite key. Um, while we're talking about Sherry, I think a cool thing that we work with Sherry with is for special needs gymnastics. So at the Y, we have a multi sport drop in zone where we give free space 
for kids under 17 in the community to try different sports every week. Because it's free, somehow we attracted a few special needs Asian families that come in. And from that group, a community leader, leader stepped up and start helping that group to organize activities within the facility every week. So we continue to offer free sport for them for the last year or so. And they jumped to about 30 to 50 families. But that is when Sherry and Univision Trust came into the play, where they say, can we get funding for this group and diversify their offerings to offer special needs gymnastics classes that's targeted at this community who doesn't often have catered programs for them? And we they will manage to get some fun for them. And we trial piloted the program um, term four and term three this year. And because of the participation and success, they were able to secure funding for the next 12 months in 2024 as well, and ensure that the program is sustainable. And the big thing for us is a lot of community-led events or initiatives, they're often one-off. There's not that long-term plan and go through it. And a lot of that I think saw in the chat as well is funding, right? It is funding and space. And that is a barrier that you have to get over, like how to somehow get through that hurdle um, regardless. And I think Sports Auckland definitely does a lot of great work there. And I'm pretty happy to be with um, working with Sam and Sherry. And the other thing that's quite sports, that's funding led is sports camps. So the why we have we have a camp down in South, it's called Camp Adair. Um, so, not, so South Auckland has often been in lower day South schools. And a big part for them, uh, because of that, a lot of the kids in South Auckland could not afford going to sports camp like we always, like other kids will do. But because we were able to unite all the schools together and collaborate, we were able to get through funding through John, John Walker Fields of Dreams from the Y itself. And we offered two years in a row of sports camps to kids at $50 for three days, accommodation, food, sports, everything covered. Right. I think a lot of this is what overcomes participation barrier. And that got the kids to try a lot of different sports within three days and ultimately find their passion to see what sports they want to pursue. I want to keep doing that every single year. Um, and I saw Bernadette from Underdog Basketball Club is in the chat too. So she does a lot of good work in East Auckland doing basketball clubs. Um, and with her, without my connection with her, we're able to try out inter-club competition. So, there's, so of course, there's representative play led by RSOs, but there's also community-led club, whether it's just a group of dads teaching their kids basketball or badminton. But a lot of these these communities stays within their bubble and they don't know the pathway or the connection to the pathway of that sport. Um, but over the last few years, we were able to do inter-club basketball competition with Bernadette, uh, with my own club, East Paladins, with her club, Underdog, um, with the club from Dilworth, the club from North Shore. But through this interaction, it introduced a lot of players to different people within their community that has the same passion but also show them different pathways for their sports, right? Sometimes when they're in that community group, they stay in that community group, but by branching out, they're able to see, okay, I can pay for school. I have a friend from this club that's go to the same school as me, and that would get them to pay for school team. Or actually, there's a trial next week for under 15s, under 13s, under 11s. Let's go together. Or oh, there's actually a club closer to my house that cuts down the transport, the accessibility barrier. So by creating that connection between different community led clubs and groups really pushes these kids out and branch out into the wider community. Um, and yeah, and lastly, just don't be afraid to ask for support. I think that's the other thing is that you don't have to always do everything yourself. There are people within Auckland that's very passionate about the community and wants to get people active. Um, Sports Auckland is a great start, but go out, ask for support. And there's a lot of knowledge and experience out there that caters for all aspects of the community, young, old, professional, amateurs, or just community play. Yeah. Thank you, Mark.